Many of you will remember seeing the next couple of little bits of items from Introduction to Computer Science last week, uh, last year. The most important thing, as you do research, because this module is going to become or be a research-based module. Do you remember? I don't teach answers, I just teach you questions. So that you can find good answers in a particular context. Yes, as P uh, Philip Pullman said some years ago, like 14 years ago, read widely like a butterfly, but write like a bee. You do not want to write like a butterfly. Read a bit, write a bit, read a bit, write a bit, read a bit, write a bit. It kind of is difficult to follow. And the answer, your conclusion at the end, inevitably will be just as much a surprise to you as to the reader. It's not very helpful. You remember I said that last year? Any of you? Some of you? Yeah, a few of you. <laughs> yeah. Drunken spiders walk or butterfly dotting around. Not very useful. What you've got to do as you do that reading it's to build your notes, make your notes, build your working bibliography of every last thing that is relevant that you see. And as you're doing that, you're pouring knowledge into your head. So that as you start thinking about it in the bath or in the shower or wherever else, or on the bus, you start thinking about what's the structure of that. And you can start building a bit of structure. And before you know it, you've got the answer. Remember, how many of you know of or have read the Harry Potter series, all seven books? Were you aware that J.K. Rowling, before she wrote the first word of the first book, had essentially planned out all seven of the books in the major topic areas? She knew what was going to happen through each book and at the end. And then she started putting pen to paper and so on. I don't want you to start writing your assignment, your article, on the very first day. I want you to spend a lot of time researching and thinking about things, and the sessions in here will be, I will talk to you a little bit about some context and some big questions, and then it, there'll be probably typically three big questions each week. And so a lot of the time you're going to be researching for find the tr traditional five good sources that are, help you to answer each of the big questions. So you'll get about 15 minutes to do your research and perhaps make some notes. Build your working bibliography. And then have a few minutes to discuss with those around you what your sources are, share sources, share ideas. And then we'll have a little bit of time where you feed back and share across all of you all of the ideas that have come out of that research. And then we'll move on to the next big question, and so on, through the two hours here. And then when we go to Group A and Group B for the workshop tutorial session, that's when you'll be doing some more guided work that relates more and more to researching for your assignment, and applying those new ideas that come from this session into what you're going to be writing, and building the structure here, the heading, the chapter heading is header one, the section heading is header two, the subsection levels header three. 
and build that structure, or maybe you use a mind map. I really don't mind how you work. Whatever works for you, whether you do it in Word with the headings and subheadings, or whether you use it in PowerPoint, or on paper. Maybe a mind map on paper, or a mind map electronically. Whatever works. <coughs> but I want you to be building that structure so that each week, Winnie and I can talk to you, and you can tell us how you're moving on and solving different parts of that sequence I showed you in the contextual areas of the module. And then at some point, when you've got lots of information in your head, lots of ideas, lots of structure, you can start actually putting pen, finger to keyboard and build that article that you want to write. But I want, as I've said before, that linear narrative, that linear story that shows what you're trying to communicate to me about the problem, the context, the justified frameworks and so on that you're using, and then why it's going to be better. I want a nice, clear story that communicates to me and anybody else your ideas. Some of you are going to find these articles invaluable as discussion items with your interviews for your placement. Because you're going to be doing stuff here that is going to be relevant to almost all of the interviews you're going to have. Get feedback every year about the value of each of these assignments in this year and next year in terms of discussion topics that show off your ability to communicate, to think clearly, to analyse and synthesise, bring ideas together. And what I'm looking for in this is are ideas that have never been published before, where you're bringing ideas from over there and there which no one has linked together. New perspectives on developing IT services. That's what the challenge is today for this semester. How many of you remember using Plato? In ICS last year? If the, those of you who've done Plato, it might be worthwhile going back to Plato and just checking your memory, proving that you can still do the citing and referencing. Those who haven't done it, go find it. You'll find it on the library section of uh, Udo. Because, as you'll see when you look at the assignment spec, like last year with ICS, citing and referencing perfectly is worth 8% uh, of your grade, 8 marks towards your grade. So getting that right, which is trivially simple once you've practiced it, is worthwhile doing. It's 8 marks straight, in your, straight there before you've even written anything. Well, pretty much so. I'm not going to go through the all 31 pages of this. You can pick it up and look at some of this stuff yourselves as well. I'm going to cover, look at the first two. For many, in many ways, it's going to be kind of a restatement of what you learned last year, um, but upping the level for you because you know, it is two years later, a year later, and life is more complicated for you this year. Higher standard. You remember what we said about quoting is basically direct copying of what people have written. Now you may remember last year I said that in the field of business and IT and computing, in the academic publications, there are almost no pieces of work that are published by academics which is actually of 
good enough quality and precisely enough um, written that it is worth bothering to quote it. The only really good sources that are worth quoting directly, word for word, is in law, where you're quoting part of an uh, article of law for legal analysis, perhaps a judge's uh, comments, which are very, very carefully considered and written, or in comparative literature where you're comparing one verse in this poem with another verse in another poem or whatever. And it's useful to have those two verses quoted actually in the text so that it's easy to, to compare. Broadly speaking, in the fields of business and computer science and IT and so on, we do not choose our words that carefully that it is worth the effort of copying and pasting them. Because in any case, once you have got a quotation there, nicely in brackets and, or quote marks or indented into a paragraph with its citation, and let's say 50 or 100 words, you then have to write something about why that is relevant, what it's there for, what it means to your argument. So you might just as well save that wasted 100 words of a quotation and write your own thoughts, brackets, the source. Because all I'm interested in is what you're thinking, what you're writing, your analysis, not what somebody else says. And the other thing that comes out of quoting and citing is that you're doing, you're constraining the way that you write and the sequence of your story to the sources. And it's just as bad to say blogs, bracket, 2013, suggests that, and then Smith, 2014, disproves that, because the he says, she says form of citing, again, constrains your ability to tell your story in your words. Because remember that all of the assignments, all of the times that you write, the times that I and Winnie write, we are actually providing a window on our brain, a window on our thinking, to the person who's listening or reading our assignment. I and Winnie will be using your, your written, written articles to find out how you research, how you connect ideas together to come up with something really powerful, persuasive and interesting. That's all it's there for, to find out how your brain works and then we score how your brain works. That's what the mark is about, basically. So I don't want to, I'm not going to read any quotations. All quotations are mentally snow picked out. Because all that proves is you can find, do a bit of research and do copy paste or copy type. And that is not university level activity. It's a mechanistic thing that a 10 year old can do, copy, paste. It's a 12, 14, 15 year old, I can find it, copy, paste. Now you're all grown ups, you're adults, and you're learning critical thinking, critical analysis, synthesis of ideas. So I don't want to see quotations. I don't want to see anything that is copy, pasted particularly if there is no citation, because that is plagiarism, and we get tetchy. And you will then, once you've been caught, will then have an interesting and rather difficult discussion with the head of the uh, School of Electronics, Computing and Maths. So the thing you have to think about, if you do decide to put a few very short quotations in there with citations is does your writing make sense without that quotation? Because I'm not going to read it. Because it's not a window in your mind. It's just you can copy paste accurately. Regularly, people try and get away with it, and they're, okay, so I'm going to put a big quotation in, it's 150 words, put the citation, and indent it nicely so it's clear it's 
I've copied it as a quotation. Try not to do that. You're not going to get very good grade because there's not enough of your own thought there to be marked. I mean, technically, if you have a really good patchwork, in, for, uh, in other words, a whole selection of quotations, properly cited, nice bibli bibliography with all the references, with a few linking words that makes it read smoothly, technically, that is not an academic offence. It is mind-bendingly lazy. It takes an astounding amount of effort to do, actually. And at the end of it, you will be surprised to get around about 10% grade. Because there's nothing of your own thought in it. So, if you really do need to have a little something that sets a context, and sometimes it's actually quite nice to have a short phrase in quotes as an introduction to a section that makes a particular point. So, cite it, give it its citation, and it might be a little piece of poetry, who knows what it is, but something that makes the thing come to life. That's okay. Anything more than that, don't bother. Citations are there, an acknowledgement that you found the information, it might be a quotation, or it might just be, this is the source of the information I'm using to make this point. So every time you remember that you are saying this is a fact, here's a citation of where you got it. Otherwise, it's your fairy story. And you are not writing fairy stories unlike J.K. Rowling. So any fact that is stated, made as an assertion, any theory, any framework, any concept that you introduce, needs to have a citation, otherwise it's a fairy story. And as I say, you are not writing fairy stories. You are writing evidence-based critical analyses of situations. So, so, and so that you then ask me, Richard, how many uh, references do I need in my article? And the answer is, I'm not going to tell you. The question I will pose back to you, however, is, in English, a paragraph consists of, in our terms, a set of uh, some, uh, ideas, concepts, facts, figures, whatever, which you are comparing and contrasting. So that kind of gives you a perspective that each paragraph should have at least two separate citations, two different ideas that you can then compare and contrast. That's the barest minimum, is a couple of citations per paragraph. Now, if you're doing high-grade critical evaluation, then you're doing compare and contrast from more than two sources, more than two concepts, more than two perspectives. That kind of suggests you need more than two citations per paragraph. It's not saying that you need to have more than two or three unique ones per paragraph over the various paragraphs. You might want to reuse some of your citations from there back down here. So you're, you may not end up with n paragraphs times three or more references. Some of those references can be reused. And the purpose of the citation is twofold. One, to say, this is who or where I got the ideas from. And just as importantly, it helps the interested reader find that source if they want to develop their own research. do this well a it's supporting providing that turning your writing from a fairy story into an academically credible piece of work gives credit to your sources because otherwise if you're using other people's ideas without giving cre credit to it 
you are stealing their ideas. And none of us like to have our iPods and iPhones and smartphones and all our technology that we have, our personal technology, stolen off us. We don't like our wallets being stolen. We don't like our IDs being stolen and so on. Taking people's or published ideas and using them without credit is stealing their ideas. Demonstrates that you're capable of academic level research. At second year level, occasionally you're going to find a pointer, a reference to a source you can't easily get hold of. In which case you would, you can use secondary referencing, which is along the line, or, or citations, which is um, self 2014 in um, <clears throat> McKinsey 2016. You've seen 26, McKinsey's 2016, but you can't find the publication, my publication, that she was referencing. You can do that if you like, occasionally. Preferably don't, because you don't know what the context is. You don't know that when you actually use my ideas in the context that I wrote about it. So secondary referencing and citing is a bad idea as a general point. So try to get primary sources as much as possible. <coughs> Where and when? Every time you use someone else's ideas. Even when you are programming. If you copy someone's code, give the credit in the source code. Now this is going to be interesting sometimes when you're doing, in this uh, not in this module, but in while you're doing BSCIT, particularly in your SAS, and advanced analytics coding, where sometimes we're going to set you a challenge to the whole class, perhaps. I want you to find some code which does this. And you work together, you collaborate, and out of that, you some one or two of you are going to coalesce around a really cool piece of SAS code, a macro or something, which will do something valuable that all of you need to use. Depending on the circumstances, it may well be allowed by your tutor that you all use that. And I mean, there's one coming up in the uh, dissertation project I've got for this year where there are 17,000 files spread across about 200 folders that I need the students to be able to suck the whole lot into SAS. And by doing it by hand, it's kind of a little bit difficult importing 17,000 files, as you well know. And I want someone to come up with a chunk of code which we can then put up on our library somewhere. So there are times when you can do that, but if you are copying other people's code, make sure you identify this has been borrowed from here. And whenever you make a statement of fact, an assertion, you use a citation to make it very plain that's where you got the facts from. Last year I talked a bit about so what, didn't I? I seem to remember mentioning so what to you. Just a reminder, as you develop that structure, that linear structure, the golden line from the start to the conclusion, all the time, keep asking yourself, challenging yourself, so what? And what particularly, once you start adding the words to that structure, keep thinking, so what? Why did I put that phrase there, that sentence there, that paragraph there? Is it the right place? Does it add to something? Have I answered all the questions? Think, so what? All the time. And if you're working together, politely, but use so what? And often when I'm talking to you, and I, maybe uh, Winnie will start doing it as well, you start explaining something and stop thinking, wow, I've done well. We'll probably come back and say, okay, so what? Why? Expand. What's the because? So what about that? And as you start looking at this research, you're going to have to think, so what, about almost everything. But remember the rule is, you can use any source except wiki sources. Yeah, sometimes you're going to go into the technical academic journals, some of the stuff. 
but a lot of it I'm expecting you to be using more public web stuff. The stuff that comes with Tech Republic, Computer Weekly, Computing from BCS, from Sophia, from some of the articles that you'll get in LinkedIn if you're connected to the right news feeds. The first thing you have to think about is so what and so who? Who is writing that? Is it a well written piece? Have a look at their uh, LinkedIn profile, see who they are, what their job role is, what they're doing. Have a look at some of their other postings to see whether they make a credible, sensible story. Does it look as though it's authoritative? Can I rely on it? And that's really what critical appraisal of your sources is all about. A lot of the time when we're looking at your work, and this will happen quite a bit, I suspect, in your first formative review, you won't get it next year or in the third year because you'll have already learnt your lesson in this module with me. But probably that week, that 11th week, we're going to be going through and I'll say, so what? And highlight a passage. Because actually, rather than answering something you've inadvertently, because you hadn't thought so what, you've actually left a question hanging that I or Winnie with our experience, our background, can see, yeah, it goes a little way, but you suddenly left a great big hole for everybody to fall into, more particularly you. And so we'll be challenging you to actually find the answers to that. And don't, even if you found it, don't leave it to three pages later. There is nothing more irritating to me and Winnie to say, have written, a, if we're doing it in the old days, in red, so what? Where's the answer? And you've forgotten about this. And then two pages later, here's the answer. And we have to go, ah, now I've got to go back and find that red ink and cross it all out. That's seriously tedious, it's seriously irritating, and it destroys the credibility of your writing. You've lost authority. And what you're trying to do this year is to develop your personal authority so that when you're out with your um, companies next year, they will trust you and they will rely on you. So, so what becomes hugely valuable. Let's go through this last little section and then we'll break for a while. Because we need, we're getting a bit tired. We need to have a little sort of wander around. Those of you who are coming back can come back after a cup of coffee or something at six down upstairs, and we'll just finish that. I just want to finish this last little bit. Here was a bit of um, journalese that I came across about six, seven years ago, in the early days of developing uh, internet broadband. Global broadband subscriptions have increased by 75%. That was actually in, I forget which pe uh, j computer journal it was. Horrifying. Why? What questions, and this is over to you now, what questions do we actually need to ask ourselves, or the article writer, the journalist, about that, to make some sense out of it? Where? Where? How? It's how? Why? Yeah, just stop playing with those words. Yeah, <laughs> but, okay, where? Why are you asking a question of where? Well, you can imagine like, <coughs> that would be driven by somewhere like China rather than a remote island somewhere again. You know. Yeah. What was the next one? When? No. no? How. How. Yeah. What sort of reason? Why would we ask the question how about this one? It could be a specific technology that's come about. Have you seen today's news about... Uh, Nokia have done some work on fibre that takes the fibre transmission capability up to terabit per second. Per strand. So that frees this off a bit. What other questions do we want to know about? Compared to what? Compared to what? Yeah, what's the baseline? 
Yeah, I mean, what, what is, how many broadband were there X days ago? Mm -hmm. What are we at now? What other questions do we need to ask ourselves to make sense out of that rather glib piece of wording? It's about a period of time. A period of time, is it a few months or a few years? When did that start? When did that 75% growth finish? Because without the starting time, it's very difficult. And from what levels? <coughs> And is it universal? Is it the same in every country? Or does it vary across different countries? So, yeah. Oh, another one that we've forgotten about is, why is it important? Does it matter to anybody? Or is it just a, oh, wow, sort of fact? And finally, who said? There's no citations there at all. So I then rewrote it. And there's one or two interesting little problems still with how it's been rewritten. And you'll notice there's one, two, three, four citations in one small paragraph there as well. And it turned out it was 75% during 2002, and that was computing. It's a good in, this is a good indicator of the importance of broadband to the carriers, that's the, ISP, the people who actually have all the fibre and so on. The problem was that the UK market, only back in 2002, only 5% of inhabitants had access to broadband, which, by the way, was counted at 250 kilobits a second. Compared to the situation in Korea back in 2003, or two, sorry, when 21% of inhabitants had access to broadband. And here's two sources. And so you have inhabitants and inhabitants for that statement, but then unfortunately the new data in 2004 from the Times on the 19th of September was the level has increased to 16% of households. So you've got a bit of a fruit salad there. Because we don't know that 16% of households having access to broadband actually is the same as 16% of, in, of um, inhabitants having access. So you have to be very careful about the units of measure, for example. This is more academically correct than the first one, which was pure journalese and was designed to catch, oh, I've got a factoid out there, which says 75%. But from 5% in the UK with a very low baseline. So that kind of helping you to think about why we do citations, how we build an academically credible analysis, and how you get away from fairy tales and journalese. You are not journal journalists, you are academic researchers. Be rigorous. Briefly, your sources, because you're going to be using a lot of outside sources, non-IEEE type sources, because they're re reported or researched five years ago and published after a long, long process, about five, three or four or five years later. So I want mo modern stuff. However, where was it published? These are kind of levels of authority um, in the classical sense of thinking about public, uh, your sources. But it's helping you to think about, OK, so who's published? Whose ideas am I using? Is that valid? Is it useful? Is it modern? Is it? long ago. Is it leading edge? Who published it? Have other people referred to it? You can look at citation indices for that sort of stuff. However, one of the interesting things about all of the assignments I'm going to be setting you from this year and next year, all of the topics are going to be leading edge. No one will have published on them before. So you are going to be researching leading edge stuff. So that's why I say don't look in the academic sources by and large. Because they won't have been covering the stuff you are researching and publishing now. But you will be bringing a lot of information 
to, from today and yesterday and a few weeks ago about the things that are going on in the world of IT. And that's going to be really interesting. But you must judge your sources. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes the introduction to the module. The things I want you to be doing as you move from a taught environment to a learning by research. You are going to be teaching yourselves a lot. You are going to become more knowledgeable and more expert in, your, in the, the topic you're going to use for your assignment than anyone else in the world. So you, oi! So you are going to become experts in the field and people will hopefully look at and read your articles. One last thing, I'll stop this.